So now we come to the back of the tank, where ordinarily I talk about track tension. And I'm not going to do it this time. Half of you are going, hooray! And the reason for this is, it's exactly the same as you saw in the M3 Medium and the M10 Tank Destroyer. It's the big wrench, the big bolt. That's as far as I'll go with that. Instead, I will mention the engine, the Wright Whirlwind R975. When we first encountered this engine in the M3 Medium, it was rated by the manual at 400 horsepower, running a higher octane level of fuel. In this installation, though, the manual rates it as only 350 horsepower, running on 80 octane. Now, the engine had a couple of quirks. Now, the first one was its tendency to over rev. Uh, I was talking with a driver of the time, and he said that uh, the problem was, in times when you really, really needed the power, like somebody's shooting at you and you want to go somewhere really quickly, you didn't think too much about the engine. You just put your foot down, the engine would rev up, and then you had a good chance of blowing the engine. The other problem, being a radial engine, is that you have to hand crank the thing because all the fluids, the oils, will all settle into the bottom cylinders and you end up with a hydrostatic lock. As a result, if you have a cold engine, you gotta turn it over, hence turning over the engine. And to do that, you use the hand crank, which is simple enough. Insert it into this little hole back here. The M18 gun motor carriage, the Hellcat, had the same thing. Let's feed it through. It hooks in to a little notch in there, and you can then start cranking 60 times before the engine is considered to be suitably uh, rotated and you can start it up. Now, to give you a better idea as to what's going on back here, let's move over to the demonstrator model we have around the corner. So now we have the demonstrator model. You can see the aiming mark that's on the inside of the tank. And you can also see from the bar just how deep inside it is. Fit it into the notch, start cranking, you'll start seeing the radiator fans turning on the far side. I'm not gonna do it all 60 times. So that done, let's put this right back in. Now, of course, you wouldn't have to do this if the engine was warm, but still, I have no doubt that the crew is very happy to get engines a little bit more modern later on in the war, that you didn't have to do this every time. Uh, again, the M18 gun motor carriage, you still had to have the radial engine. While I'm back here, the other two things you'll see here, it's the large air filters and the exhaust ports and the cooling air would be blasted through the big gap in between the whole roof and the back wall. It would be deflected downwards right into the dust and dirt, just what you didn't want to have signifying your position to anybody within miles in North Africa's desert. There are also sand shields you'll see on the side of the hull, the holes for the mounting of the sand shields, they did not last very long. Once they were broken off, nobody ever bothered trying to repair them. So getting up, this is not the hardest tank to get up of. You got good handholds, and of course you can use the bogies. So now we're up here, uh, we can start talking about the different engine deck variants. M4s and M4A1s with the Continental Radial, they had an engine deck similar to this with an armored intake up the front and no grill further back. The M4A2 was the twin diesel version, and it used the same power pack we saw on the M10. This had large grills opening up on the rear deck. The M4A2, of course, was mainly a lend lease tank. The Soviets used it, some of the British uh, got them. And of course, the US Marines used them as well, simply because they were the only Shermans that they uh, had available at the time. And the Marines said, well, we'll take these now, please. Thank you very much. The M4A3 was a version that had the Ford V8, the GAA, excellent engine. About 500 horse, this became the de facto American tank after the war. Saw plenty of service in Korea. This also had large grills on the back, a different filler part uh, configuration, of course, because there's only the one engine. Uh, the grills were a little bit larger than those on the M4A2. The M4A4 was the one with the wonderful Chrysler 30 cylinder contraption, the uh, A57 Multibank. This was the longer engine with the longer engine deck and your visual uh, identifier was outside. The British really actually liked the M4A4 and we'll be coming to that one in a future story. 
The M4A6 was another version based off of the M4A4 chassis, so it was also elongated. It had a Caterpillar multi-fuel radial engine. However, only 75 of those were built and they only ever saw service in the US. So if you see a tank with spaced road wheels uh, you're, and it's actually on operation in, in Europe, it's uh, British probably, uh, but it's certainly an M4A4. There was the M4A5 designation, which you will note I have skipped. The M4A5 is what the Americans called the Ram. Quite why they did that, I don't know, because the Ram was really an M3 based vehicle. If you look at the builder's plate of this Grizzly, it actually says Montreal Locomotive Works M4A1. So perhaps that's why they didn't come up with a separate designation for the Grizzlies themselves. Okay, so to get the engine deck up, which is a two-man job, I have summoned my beautiful assistant here, Meathead. This is your moment of fame now to the Inside the Hatch audience. If you don't know him, he's popular enough on the NA community side of things. So if you give me a hand here, please. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That was heavy. Go away. So now we have the engine bay open, you can see the Continental as it is installed inside the tank. Now it's mounted on the brackets, there are four large bolts that are holding it in place. So if you wanted to pull the engine out, you'll undo the, the deck, lift that out of the way, lift up the engine by of course disconnecting the power shaft, fuel lines and what have you. This particular engine will get the tank up to a burst speed of 24 miles an hour and a sustained speed of about 21. Of course this was the weakest of the engine options. Later versions of the tank would go a little bit faster, up to 30. You can also see in here the red pipes for the fire extinguisher system. This was a two-shot system. It can be fired from either inside the tank or by use of the handle on the engine deck just left rear of the turret. For the forward, under its own fuel tank port is the auxiliary motor. This, of course, would be used for running the systems without draining the main fuel tanks and of course putting wear and tear on the main engine. Speaking of fuel, the fuel in this system would be 168 gallons. That would be about enough to get you 120 miles. Some help he was. I, mean, I told him to go away and he took it literally. Uh, okay, it's a grizzly but who's keeping track? Now the first thing you'll note as you're looking at the turret is that there is no loader's hatch, which is what you might call a surprising omission. In fact, the real thing is what on earth were they thinking? Now in fairness to them, they were still learning. And if you look at the M3 medium, that didn't have a loader's hatch either, but it was a smaller turret. The problem, of course, you can imagine, if you've got to get out of the tank in a hurry for some reason, like, I don't know, the tank is on fire, uh, it's a bit difficult if you don't have a hatch of your own. What is perhaps less excusable was it took a year and a half uh, of production and about a year's worth of combat experience before somebody finally figured out how to drill a hole in the roof of the turret and install a hatch. These started coming off the production lines October 43. Now there was a retrofit kit put out, so if you were in the field and you had a no hatch Sherman, you could get this uh, kit that would come out, it will tell you make a hole here in the turret roof and install this hatch and the loaders became much happier. But still, it was a surprising omission. Uh, also surprising was the idea didn't die. If you look at the Merkov F4, the Israeli tank, uh, the early models of that looks like they did not come with a loader's hatch. Uh, doubtless, this proved unpopular, as is evidenced by the fact that after a very brief period of time, the tank started appearing with loader's hatches. It's a structural weakness, but you got to give the crew a chance. Other features around the turret. Speaking of hatches, this is not the original hatch that came with a early 75mm tank. This was the originally the split hatch. Simply two pieces of simple metal that came up. There would be a single rotating periscope in one of them and that's how you would see out. Yeah, very unsatisfactory. It also had a mount for the caliber 50 on the ring. Now what it turned out happened was that the vision cupola was the same diameter as that of the split hatch. So it was actually very easy to take the vision cupola and put it in place at a split hatch and all of a sudden you have a much, much better hatch. So for example, this one now has an azimuth ring if you needed it for some reason, as well as the periscope, simple, easy hatch to come down. The split hatches kept going quite a way through the war. They did start installing springs to make them easier to open in the middle of 43. 
Uh, still, uh, the Grizzlies, as near as you can tell, they all came out with originally the split hatch design. There was also the British Vision Cupola, which is a very good design, uh, but obviously the Americans didn't use it. As you move further around, you got the mounting point for the Caliber 50, which has now been moved back and left. The machine gun, of course, could only be fired really by somebody at standing on the back deck, so not really useful for the crew. This is a rest for the barrel, so the gun will be resting forward and horizontally this way. Just latch it out of the way, put it down, and you can see the spotlight. It could be controlled from within the tank, the loader had a handle, or it could be dismounted and handheld in a pistol grip that the commander has. If you move forward, we see the commander's vein sight, and this is used simply to gauge direction as he's telling the gunner to spin onto a target. He knows roughly which way the gunner is looking. Speaking of the gun, you'll see that there are very large screws at the front. This is done for modularity. The idea was that you could turn the tank into pretty much any required configuration by simply swapping out the gun, undo the bolts, and install module A, module B. Not in the field. I mean, once it left the factory, the idea was it was the same thing, but you could very easily swap it out on a production line. And these would be anything from the 57 mm 75, the 105, or they were hoping for the 3 inch. Didn't work out, we'll come back to that story at a future point. That's pretty much the outside of the turret roof, so uh, now let's go inside. So now moved inside where the commander will be seated, I'm on a fold down seat. It's very simple, lift latch, fold down. Uh, if I wanted to be seated with my head out, there is actually an additional platform down here, which I have folded out of the way. It is cozy in here. The breech recoil guard is taking up a lot of my space, and I've had to place one leg on either side of the gunner seat. Uh, not a good start. Controls as he's going around. Well, he's going to have a override handle here, a push forward for left, back for right, and all this is is a simple physical cable that goes all the way down and moves the gunner's control handle, which then moves the rest of the system. Very useful for getting a gunner onto target quickly. You don't have to yell at them to go left, right, hey, you missed it, you've gone too far, you're other left. I'm sure you're familiar with it, some of you. As you start moving around, underneath is a pistol grip for the spotlight. So you would dismount it from the position on the front of the turret and put it on here and you can wave around and see whatever it is it needs seeing. To see out, speaking of seeing, the six vision blocks on the direct vision uh, cupola. So again, early tanks did not have this vision cupola. They had the simple split hatch that comes down with the periscope in the middle of it. This is far better. I mean, not, not ideal by modern standards, but by World War II standards, this is one of the best cupolas you're gonna get. As you move around to the back, you see rations. Packaged by Patton Food Products, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ration type K. Uses a waterproof container for matches, cigarettes, and other items. For security, hide the empty can and wrappers so they cannot be seen. I'm in a 40 ton tank, you know, a 35 ton tank, and I'm worried about seeing wrappers. The radio behind them is either an SCR 508, 528, or 538, all things depending. And this is a 20 frequency set. You can listen on 20 and speak on 10. They're selectable. You, program, you spend your time ahead of time programming your crystals, and then you use the push buttons to select whichever frequency it is that you want to transmit it on or monitor. Pretty similar to the way we have things today. That's pretty much it for the commander seat, and next I'm going to move forward to the gunner.